The sermon today is titled, The Lamp of the Body. It's based on Luke 11, 33 to 36. Jesus often used the lamp as a figure in different ways in order to teach various lessons during his ministry. He sometimes used even the same parable in different settings and made different applications. Before we study the lamp of the body in Luke 11, 33 to 36, let's first look at some examples. The figure of the lamp. Jesus taught his disciples that they are the light of the world. And for his disciples, let your light so shine. In the Sermon on the Mount, following the Beatitudes, in Matthew 5, 14 to 16, Jesus said, after telling them that they are the salt of the earth, he also used a, a metaphor, you are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. We see here the usage of the word lamp. The lesson in this passage is for his disciples to be a positive example, positive influence for God in the world. Let your light so shine before men that they may give you the glory no, that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Paul, writing by inspiration, taught the lesson taught by Christ. Philippians 2, 14 to 16, Do all things without complaining and disputing, that you may become blameless and harmless, children of God without fault, in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast the word of life, so that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain or labored in vain. Paul looks at the world around him, crooked and perverse generation, and he says, among whom you shine as lights in the world. Churches, of Christ today. Christians, let your light so shine wherever the, your church, the church of Christ may meet, wherever there may be Christians in this world, let your light so shine that people see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Jesus also used the parable of the lamp to teach his disciples concerning the good that they do and the glory they bring to God. Matthew chapter 6, 22 to 23, we'll look at this passage again later. Here he uses the lamp again in a parable, as we'll study later in Luke 11. The hypocrites, we see in Matthew 6, 1 to 18, did good, not for the reason of giving God the glory, of bringing glory to God, they did good to be seen by men. Not that men would see their good works and glorify the heavenly Father, but that they would see their good works and glorify them. But the disciples of Christ would bring glory to God in doing good deeds. Matthew 6, 1 to 18. The heart of the disciple, Jesus said, was to be in heaven, not on earth. Matthew 6, 19 to 21, lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, not on earth, but in heaven. Where is your heart? Hopefully, as disciples of Christ, our hearts are in heaven. The disciple of Jesus was to serve God with love and loyalty. You cannot serve God and mammon, Jesus said, Matthew 6, 24. Be determined to serve God faithfully with love and loyalty. We also see in 
Mark 4, 1 to 20, the parable of the sower. After Jesus taught the parable of the sower, with the seed being the word of God and the sower being the teacher, Christ, he taught a lesson using a lamp. A lamp, he said, is put on a lampstand, a candle on a candlestick, not hidden. What good would a candle be if put under a basket, a lamp, if it was put in a cellar or in some hole, if it was put under a basket or under a bed? Jesus said also, it says that Jesus said to them, is a lamp brought to be put under a basket? Or under a bed? Is it not to be set on a lampstand? Yes, of course. Some have pointed out perhaps there was some humor in Jesus' lesson. Who would put who would put a lamp under a basket or a lamp even under a bed? Who would do that? Of course you don't do that. You put it on a lampstand so the light could be seen. Not hidden. The sharing of the word of God. You share it with everyone. Sow the seed everywhere. Of course, the seed lands on different kinds of hearts. People respond in different ways. The same, same word of God. God wants his word to be taught and understood. And for those who hear, to be fruitful. Mark 4, 22 to 23. He said, for there is nothing hidden which will not be revealed, nor is there anything been kept secret, but that it should come to the light. If anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. So use your ears to hear. Pay attention to what Jesus has to say. Each is responsible for what he has been given. Mark 4, 24. Take heed what you hear. With the same measure you use, it will be measured to you, and to you who hear, more will be given. Jesus taught that if the multitude heard what he taught, he would teach them more. They would be ready to hear more. Unfortunately, there were those who were not ready, who did not hear. If the multitude did not heed what they had heard, they would not be given more and may even lose what they already have. Mark 4, 25, he said, For whoever has, to him more will be given, but whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. Luke also records the same passage. Sometimes as you study the gospel accounts, you'll see parallel passages. Sometimes they're the same setting with perhaps different wording. Sometimes a writer may record an event that the other writers did not record. Sometimes they record the same event, and you may learn more from a detailed study of all the, the writers. Here, Luke 8, 16 to 18, Luke mentions the same point that we already saw in Mark. He said, no one, when he has lit a lamp, covers it with a vessel or puts it under a bed, but sets it on a lampstand that those who enter may see the light. As you study the New Testament, the gospel accounts, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you also see the word lamps used in Luke 12, 35 to 40. And the burning lamps in the passage represents faithful Christian service to God. Luke 12, 35, he said, let your waist be girded and your lamps burning. Your waist girded, and so prepare yourself to act. And also, your lamp's burning. Be ready. Be prepared. He said, and you yourself be like men who wait for their master when he will turn from the wedding. And when he comes and knocks, they may open to him immediately. We don't have time to look at the whole passage. We're just briefly reviewing some of these passages today where we find Jesus in the figure of the lamp. But here, the lesson, be ready for the coming of the Son of Man when Christ returns. Be ready for that day. Be prepared. We do, as we look at some of these passages, we see similar lessons taught. And while different, we see some, some similar themes. Note that Jesus gave the parable after speaking of treasures in heaven. 
Luke 12, 21, verses 33 to 34. And again, we already mentioned in our study, those laying up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Where is your heart? Who do you serve? You cannot serve God and mammon, riches. Jesus also taught the parable of the, of the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the lost son. The last being the parable of the prodigal son. Jesus points out in these three lessons the value of one soul, that God cares even for one. Jesus taught the joy over one sinner who repents. Luke 15, 8 to 10. He gave the parable of a woman who had 10 silver coins and she lost one. What did she do? Well, she lit a lamp and she swept the house and she searched diligently or carefully until she found the, the coin. And when she did find the coin, then she calls for friends and neighbors and she calls for them to rejoice with her for she found the piece that was lost. We might do something similar today with our friends. You know how I've been looking for that thing for a long time now? Well, I finally found it. Well, she found the lost coin and she rejoiced, called her friends and neighbors to rejoice with her. Jesus makes the point in verse 10, likewise I say to you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Repentance is important for us today for salvation. Luke 13, 3, I tell you nay or no, unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Of course, Jesus wants no one to perish. But if we do not repent, we'll perish in our sins. There's joy in heaven over one sinner who repents. If you are practicing sin, we hope that you will repent of your sins. Jesus compared John to a lamp as a prophet of God's word. He was the burning and shining lamp, and you were willing for a time to rejoice in his light. There are those who, perhaps of the novelty, came to hear him, later turned away. Some were able to, willing to listen for a time, but later turned away from John. He was the burning and shining lamp. You remember how the Pharisees came to John's baptism? And John the Baptist, as he baptized or immersed people in water. Who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bring, bring forth fruits worthy of repentance. Well, we've looked at several examples of the usage of the word lamp in Jesus' teaching. Let's get to our lesson today and note the context of the parable. We're looking at Luke chapter 11 and verses 33 to 36, and we'll get to that. We will in just a moment. But before we do, let's very briefly look at the context. In a way, we've been looking at context as we've looked at usages of the word lamp in the New Testament. But we note that during Jesus' ministry, Jesus healed people who were, in some cases, physically blind and could not see. However, there were people who were spiritually blind and would not see. You think of the blind man in John 9. Here was a man who was born blind. Jesus restored his sight and he was able to see. People asked him how he was able to see and he pointed out Jesus. People did not believe. But he believed. And we see that he worshipped Jesus. He believed in Jesus, the Son of God. After Jesus healed him, he was able to see, restored his sight. We see that he, he met Jesus again, and we see how Jesus asked if he believed, and he did. When he realized that Jesus was the Son of God. But the Pharisees were blind spiritually, and they would not see Here's the blind man teaching the Pharisees a lesson on sight. Note the parable of the lamp of the body in its context in Luke 11. And let's note a, an overview of the section. 
Sometimes as you're studying a particular passage, it helps to look at an overview of the section of the scripture. Now, while there were some people who believed Jesus, there were others who opposed him. It happened with Jesus. It certainly what happened to people today. Jesus had performed miracles such as the casting out of a demon and giving speech to a mute person. Verse 14. Even so, some spoke evil of Jesus, saying he cast out demons by Beelzebub. Verse 15. While others tested Jesus, asking from him a sign from heaven. Verse 16. What did they do with the miracles that he'd already performed? This indicates that they were not sincere. When one from the crowd praised the woman, Mary, who bore and nursed Jesus, Jesus answered, more than that, blessed are those who hear the word of God and keep it. We've already noted today the importance of hearing the word and keeping the word with the parable of the sower. And of course, the light. Let your light so shine, Matthew 5 in being a positive influence in the world. And part of that is by example, but also good works and, and the teaching of God's word. Blessed are those who hear the word of God and keep it. When the people gathered together, Jesus rebuked what he called an evil generation, saying that such seeks a sign, Luke eleven twenty nine. 29. Jesus said that Jonah became a sign to the Ninevites, Luke eleven thirty saying the Son of Man will be to this generation a sign. Speaking of his death, burial, and resurrection, Jesus also said how the Queen of the South in Luke 13, 11, 31, and the men of Nineveh in verse 32, who believe will rise up in the judgment with the men of this generation, that is the generation in which Jesus ministered and condemned it. In Luke 11 and verse 33 to 36, we see the parable, and we'll get to this more detail later on. But in Luke 11, 33, he gives the, the physical uh, usage of lamp, and in verses 34 to 36, the metaphorical usage of the lamp. And later in verses 37 to 44, Afterwards, Jesus rebuked the hypocrisy of the scribes and the Pharisees and also the lawyers in verses 45 to 52. Even as Jesus said these things, the scribes and Pharisees looked for a way to accuse him. They were not interested in the truth. Take heed how you hear. They were not interested. He who has ears to hear, let him hear, Jesus said earlier. They were not interested in hearing and obeying, keeping the word of God. Only in finding some fault with Jesus that they could latch on to and accuse him. Luke eleven fifty three 53 to 54. And as he said these things to them, the scribes and the Pharisees began to assail him vehemently and to cross-examine him about many things, lying in wait for him and seeking to catch him in something that he might say that they might accuse him. How many people here today listen, but only as far as to find some fault in a speaker? Of course, we ought to hear God and listen so that we might be able to, to do as God has said to do. Let's look now at the meaning of the parable. We've, we've noticed some usages of the word lamp. We've looked at the context of the of the parable, but let's look now more closely at the meaning of the parable. Verse 33, no one, when he has lit a lamp, puts it in a secret place or under a basket, but on a lampstand that those who come in may see the light. We, we use the expression today, the idiom, see the light, to mean to understand. We think of as Christians saw of Tarsus, who saw the light on the road to Damascus, later on went and did what he was told he must do. And so he was told to arise and be baptized and wash away his sins, calling on the name of the Lord, Acts 22 and 16. But Jesus in this passage 
before teaching the parable itself, Jesus makes an observation about the lighting of a lamp. And people would be familiar with the lighting of a lamp in order to see. Jesus said that after lighting a lamp, a man puts the lamp on a lampstand. Of course he does. He puts a candle on a candlestick. He puts a lamp on a lampstand. He does not put the lamp in a secret place that is a location where it will be hidden or concealed. He does he does not put the lamp on a under a basket or under a bed or under a vessel or in a cellar or some hole. Where does he put the lamp? He puts the lamp on a lampstand so that the light can fill the house and people who come into the house can see. And so by putting the lamp on a lampstand, those who enter the house, they see the light. The purpose of miracles, such as giving sight to the blind or the casting out of a demon, an unclean spirit, was to confirm the word. That is, the word is the word of God. Blessed are those who hear the word of God and keep it. Earlier, Jesus taught the parable of the sower, we talked about in Luke 8, 4 to 15, followed by using the same figure of a lamp in Luke 8, 16 to 18. In Luke eleven twenty eight, 28, Jesus taught, blessed are those who hear the word of God and keep it. Great lesson for us to know today. He then taught how the Son of Man, Christ, will be the sign, Luke eleven thirty. 30 being raised the third day, Luke 9, 22. Would people believe the word with his resurrection, the greatest of all signs? Unfortunately, even with Christ on the cross dying for our sins, his burial and his resurrection, there would be those who would not believe and obey. But there were people who did believe and obey the gospel, and there are people who will hear and believe and obey today. Verse 34, Jesus begins to tell the parable. He's already given the uh, physical illustration of a lamp. Now, he uses a metaphor. He says, the lamp of the body is the eye. Therefore, when your eye is good, your whole body is also is full of light. But when your eye is bad, your body also is full of darkness. Jesus transitions from a literal lamp to the metaphorical lamp of the body being the eye. There are two terms for us to consider in order to help us to better understand the parable. Let's note those two terms. First, good. We're using the New King James Version in our study today, as we do. And the first term is the word good. There are some older versions that read single. The bodily eye may be said to be good in the sense of being clear or healthy, as used in some versions today. Now, in the setting of Matthew 6, the eye may be good in the moral sense of being generous. While in Luke 11, the eye may be good in the sense of being sincere of heart. So the same parable, and perhaps the, and as in this word, the same term being used in both settings, but different applications. The evil eye may represent someone who is stingy, for example. And so the second term, bad. And again, older versions read evil. And the bodily eye may be said to be bad in the sense of being unhealthy. In the setting of Matthew 6, the eye may be bad in the moral sense of being stingy, like in Luke 16. Or the evil eye, which is condemned in various passages, Deuteronomy 15, 9, Proverbs 28, 22, and in the New Testament, Matthew 20, 15, and Matthew 22, 7, 22. While in Luke 11, the eye may be good in the sense of insincere. 
So how is it used here in this passage? Again, backing up to the passage, the lamp of the body is the eye. We looked at the lamp of the house. The house is dark without the lamp. The lamp gives light to the house. So people that enter the house can see. What about the eye? Well, if the eye is good, the eye may be good in different senses. Perhaps the, the eye is good in the sense of being healthy, single. If the eye is healthy, then the body will be full of light. You will be able to see. If the eye is diseased or unhealthy or unclear, then the body will be full of darkness. You cannot see. Uh, it may also refer to good in the sense that in, in the context of Matthew as being generous and the context of Luke as being sincere, good in that way. So there are different usages of the word, but I, I think basically here the idea is that if you have good eyes, they're healthy and clear, then the body will be a full light, you'll be able to see. But if your eye is bad, you will not be able to see. The body will be full of darkness. It's like that lantern. If the lantern functions as it should, the house will be full of light. But if the lantern does not function as it's meant to do, then the house will be full of darkness. We'll be able to see. So if the bodily eyes are good, he can see. And his body's, his body's filled with light. He's able to see. But if his bodily eyes are bad, he's blind and he's filled with darkness. However, some were spiritually blind and filled with spiritual darkness. And I, this fits the context that we studied earlier. There were Pharisees who asked for a sign. And there were others who tried to catch him in his words who were spiritually blind. And Jesus tells this parable pointing out how that there were those who would hear and would believe the word of God and keep it. They would be blessed. However, there were those such as the Pharisees, many who were hypocrites, insincere, whose eye was not good. They did not see the truth, the light, but were in darkness. They were spiritually blind. With the parable of the sower, Jesus used different types of ground to represent different types of heart, hearts. There was the wayside soil, which represented the hardened heart. There was the rocky soil that represented the shallow heart. There was the thorny soil that represented the hindered heart. Sometimes we're hindered today by, by things that are not inherently bad. We're too busy to do good things. Thorny ground and also the good ground, the good soil, representing the noble or honest heart. Unfortunately, not everyone is of that last category a noble, honest heart. And certainly there were many of the Pharisees and lawyers and scribes that were not honest. They were not noble-hearted. The eye may stand for one's disposition of heart, be, being either good or bad, single or evil. Will you receive the word of God and keep it? There's the message of the parable of the sower. You sow the seed, all kinds of ground, and all kinds of ground receive the seed. There are different results. Likewise, we teach the word of God, the same word to different people. There are people who hear and obey, and there are others who respond in different ways. Will you keep the word of God? Will you hear it and obey? He continues the parable in verse 35. Therefore, take heed that the light that which is in you is not darkness. Again, if your bodily eyes are good, if they're clear and healthy, you'll be able to see. You will not be blind. Unfortunately, there are those who are spiritually blind. Their eye is not good. They are spiritually blind and unable to see. They are in darkness. There were those such as the Pharisees who thought they were righteous. In fact, they were self-righteous, looking down on others. You may even think that you have light or the truth. Be careful that you're not instead filled with darkness or error rather than the word of God. Hear the word of God and keep it. Verse 36, if then your whole body is full of light and having no part dark, the whole body will be full of light as with 
when the bright shining of a lamp gives you light. The Pharisees, again, thought that they had the light. They were full of darkness. They could not see that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. And they tried to persuade others not to believe either. They were spiritually blind and they cared more for their wealth and glory than for serving God. Why did they do what they did? Even good things, prayer and fasting and charitable gifts, they did it to be seen. Jesus taught, you cannot serve God and mammon. Where is your heart? Is it in heaven? Or is your heart in material possessions, things on earth? Is it in on your own personal glory? Despite the miracles of Christ, they did not believe the truth. They could not see the light, God's word. We must be careful not to allow ourselves to become blind to the truth. Sometimes people become prejudiced. They've already made their minds up. Do you believe the word of God? The purpose of the signs, the miracles, was to confirm the word. However, there were those who were hard-hearted and unwilling or unable to, to hear and to believe, even with the miracles. And they, if they remained the same, would be lost. Do you believe the word of God? We hope you do. If you're not a Christian, consider, consider becoming one today. Hear the gospel. Jesus died for you, for your sins. Believe him. Repent of your sins. Confess your faith in him and be baptized for mission of your sins. Acts 2.38. If you're not a Christian, become one. If you are, but you've been unfaithful, return to him. Repent of your sins and turn to him in prayer. We hope that the lesson today has been helpful in better understanding God's word. And we invite you to return for future sermons, lessons based on God's word. Thank you for being here today.